Hello, everyone. My name is Lola Dada Ali. I'm an attorney who works at the intersection of law, accessibility, and technology. My duties include advising various business partners on matters relating to the Americans with Disabilities Act, a cornerstone law in the United States that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. I'm also an advocate and founder of the Not Your Mama's Autism podcast, a podcast that is part memoir and part interview style podcast. Our first season takes listeners on a multi-generational autism journey, dating back to our family's first autism diagnosis back in 1989, and moves into the present day, touching upon topics like access to healthcare, cultural stigma, race, intersectionality. I now travel the country giving keynotes and facilitating breakout sessions on many of these topics, and all of this has occurred, including the area of law I now practice in, this all took place within the last four years. My family and I made this decision to be more public about many facets of our personal journey to help other women, mothers, lifetime caregivers, and families like mine. With this in mind, I wanna speak with you today in a way that I truly hope helps you contemplate your why. If you are just starting on figuring out what your why may be behind your advocacy, if you have an idea of what your why can be, maybe ways upon which you can now advance that why, and the types of considerations you may want to think through when you decide to make your journey more public, this would be a speech to listen to. And by public, I don't necessarily mean announcing something on TV or doing a talk like this. I mean making a decision that looks like making your story known outside of your small, trusted circle. That may look like speaking up at your place of worship or at a city council meeting or before your school or university board. Knowing and understanding your why is a journey that's unique for every single person. So I suggest that as you listen and process this talk, you, you take some time for some self-reflection to help you get to that why if you're still not sure. So with that in mind, let's get started. Before I started on my public advocacy journey, it was imperative that I owned my story first. So in order to own your story, in order to own my story, I had to be comfortable with advancing my why. So how did I even get here in the first place? For me to find the why behind my advocacy, I had to stop compartmentalizing. As much as I was, I was trying desperately to fit everything in its place. I had to look at myself more as a whole person, not just a mom, just a wife, or just a caregiver. I had to look at who I was before I ever became any of those things, as well as dig deeper into who I became once I evolved at each new phase of life I entered into. Then I had to see how all of that contributed to the person you now see on this screen today. So let me provide some context. I'm a proud older sister to an autistic, non-speaking, intellectually disabled man now in his 30s. I'm also the proud mother of two children on the autism spectrum a boy and a girl, now ages 13 and 11. My daughter, like her uncle, my brother, is both autistic and intellectually disabled. It appears that both my brother and daughter will require lifetime care and supports. My son tested into gifted and talented curriculum in two different school districts before he even finished the first grade. 
He is also in an accelerated math curriculum. He is verbal, but sometimes has challenges with social skills. My daughter's autism manifests differently than in my son, in a way that some clinicians would categorize almost as classic autism. She uses an AAC device to communicate and is currently undergoing several forms of hearing. I'm armed with the past of significant past systemic and cultural stigma tied to being an immigrant family that grew up in a nearly all white suburb in the 1980s and 90s in the US. But the family member who had a neurodivergent diagnosis of autism and intellectual disability at a time when few even knew what those two words even meant, let alone those two words together. My parents are Nigerian immigrants, and they were in pursuit of their American dream. They were high achievers, still are, my dad becoming a pharmacist and my mom becoming a registered nurse. My brother went from talking around 18 months old to not talking at all around three years old. We would never hear him speak to us again. This changed our family's trajectory and devastated my parents. They didn't understand what was happening and society at that time truly wasn't equipped at all to even begin to explain it. My dad once told me that in those early days, a doctor looked at him and said, you either have a genius on your hands or you have a problem. Not very helpful. In many ways, I, the oldest child in an immigrant family, it would become the third parent, and I follow my parents to my brother's parent-teacher conferences at his school. In America, we call them individualized education plan meetings or IEP meetings. As a result of my brother's autism diagnosis back in 1989, I became the child advocate for another child. He was three, and I was nine. I would grow up to become the mother of not just one baby on the spectrum, but two, diagnosed a year apart from one another. My brother would now become the blueprint upon which my husband and I would raise our children in the present day. The resources my brother did not have access to, I would now fight for for my own children in the current era. I've learned through being a lifetime caregiver some way, shape, or form for over 30 years now that nothing you have been through is wasted. I am now an attorney and advocate who's fortunate enough to practice law in the digital accessibility space in this current season. I am now at a chapter in my life where the personal and the professional is quite connected in many ways, but it wasn't always like this. When people ask me how I wear so many hats as a lifetime caregiver, an advocate, an attorney, I let them know that I'm constantly working towards the whole person of me, the whole version of me, and not just the compartmentalized parts. I did this with some radical introspection. That little bit of time over time that I focused on self-reflection. This really aided me in reconnecting with who I was be ever before I ever became a lifetime caregiver, attorney, mom, wife, while holding on to all those things I mentioned. It is the reconnecting of these various parts on the regular basis that allowed me to bring forth a more whole, healed version of me that I now take to the public advocacy space and, and elsewhere originally. It was with these practices that a fuller advocacy story with them would emerge and vulnerability would be the tool that I would use to convey my story. A full advocacy story, a full advocacy story.
inherent in this journey is the ability to acknowledge your strengths, weaknesses, and potential pitfalls on this journey. And an advocacy journey can be for a season, for a lifetime. It just depends on your own particular circumstances. Knowing and understanding why you want to step into more public advocacy is not for the faint of heart. So that is something to keep in mind. The kind of introspection I did that aided me in determining and better understanding my why was with a series of questions that I asked myself and asked those I trusted very close to me where appropriate. I call it an internal audit, but it's not the type of internal audit someone would do on their job. Of course, it's more of an emotional. I call it an internal audit of a different kind. Some of the questions that perhaps you yourself can consider if you're considering an internal audit of a different kind, like I did, is where have you lived? How has where you have lived affected you? When you were a child, were there certain things you absolutely loved doing? And do you really have an opportunity to regularly participate in those type of activities today? Did you grow up in a loving, supportive home? If so, or if not, how did that shape you? What significant trauma have you been through or are currently going through? Have you addressed it? What tools did you use to do so? so that you could move forward in the midst of it. What recurring themes have you recognized throughout your life? Are these themes an opportunity to teach others about any lessons you may have learned from them? And this one was really, really pivotal for me. What breaks your heart? And why do you think it affects you so much? Some of us have lived in various places, and some of us have lived in one place for a very long time and may or may not have witnessed significant changes in one's own town. But often, the environment you grow up in can aid you in determining your why. Multiple places on the world map has influenced my advocacy today. As mentioned earlier, my, my family is from Nigeria. But I was born in Chicago and raised in its suburbs. I went to law school in Washington, D.C. I've also lived briefly in other parts of the country, but have eventually now settled in Texas, where I live with my family. 